Well, let us open the Word of God together to Romans chapter 8. The letter of Paul to the Romans chapter 8, and we'll just read the two verses that we will be considering Uh, this evening together, which is uh, verses 24 and 25. The title for our message uh, this evening, uh, God willing, is The Christian's Hope. The Christian's Hope. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and verse 25. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Let us read those verses again. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The Christian's hope. Aristotle said that hope is a waking dream. Another definition is by Henry Rollins, who's a campaigner for gay rights and so on. And he says this. Hope is the last thing a person does before they are defeated. Benjamin Disraeli said, I am prepared for the worst, but hope for the best. Now, none of those definitions or explanations or um, uses of the word hope are very good. Um, Very much the world's Uh, relationship to hope it is certainly not the Christian's relationship uh, to hope it is not the biblical uh, use of the word it is the world and how it has experienced this wrong idea of what hope is the world thinks that hope is you know just um, thinking that well if I have uh, good thoughts maybe the best Uh, will happen. Hope for the best. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, We'll see what will happen. Biblical hope is something far more than any of these. It is a good hope, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.16. God has given us good hope through grace. It is a blessed hope, according to Titus 2 and verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It is a better hope according to Hebrews 7 and verse 19. The bringing in of a better hope. It is a living or a lively hope according to 1 Peter 1 verse 3. God who has begotten us again Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So biblical hope is much more foundational and much more real. And much more sure, to put it bluntly, than the world's view of this world. The world uses it in a very uh, unsure sense. The Bible does not use it in that sense, at least when it's writing of it in the context of believers. Now this uh, word is used 129 times in the authorized version. Uh, the three books that are um, that it's, it appears more in is the, the book of Psalms 22 times, Job 16, and then Romans where we are at the moment 15 times. Uh, so those three books would be worth studying in the context of uh, this word. We will have some quotes 
uh, from uh, uh, Job and the Psalms as we look at this uh, tonight. I want to look at the subject of the Christian's hope, first of all, negatively, and then positively. What the Christian's hope is not, and then what it is. First of all, two points on the negative. It is not like the hypocrite's hope. It is not like the hypocrite's hope. And for that, I want to look at just one passage in Job. And we're going to look at Job chapter 8 and verse 11. Before we actually get into our text. Job chapter 8 and verse 11. Uh, 11 and these four verses here are very helpful or five verses Job chapter 8 verse 11 to 15 can the rush uh, or as the margin says the papyrus grow up without mire can the flag grow without water whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down it withereth before any other herb so are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish, whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be a spider's web. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. A number of weeks ago I was talking to uh, three men um, who... Uh, were professed atheists at least I think I described them the night that they were two and a half atheists two definite ones or at least said they were and the other one wasn't so sure uh, but one of their hopes was that if there is a God and they do stand before him someday that he will realize that they were actually not too bad that's the hypocrite's hope isn't it I said that's okay gentlemen if you are as good as you claim to be if you are good well then you have some chance if you are being honest about your goodness and if you're not deceived well then maybe you have some hope but as the word of God tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and the hypocrites have a hope that will collapse on that day We as Christians have indeed not that type of hope. Our hope is something far better. We are not resting in our goodness. We are not relying in weighing the good up against the bad. And hopefully God will see that we're not too bad uh, in the end. Also just one verse over in chapter uh, 27 of Job and verse 8. Chapter 27 and verse 8 reads, For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained, when God taketh away his soul? It reminds us of the verse, doesn't it? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his very soul? Uh, What does that say uh, also to the prosperity gospel? Uh, In scripture it's quite often uh, the wicked, Psalm 37 and Psalm 73, it's the wicked that are often the ones that gain. um, But the real issue is what will happen on that day when their soul is weighed in the balance? What good will it be to them? So first of all, the Christian's hope is not the same as the hypocrite's hope. It is not putting all their trust, first of all, in themselves, and then second of all, in what they have. That's the hypocrite's hope. That's the hope of the world. That's the hope of religion without Christ. What I am and what I have. The Pharisee came. I thank you, God, I am not like other men. Then he talked about what he did and so on. That's the hypocrite's hope. And that is not the Christian hope. Secondly, it is not a vain or empty hope. The world tries to convince us that it is, doesn't it? In 2 Peter 3, we need to turn to it, but in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, we read the words, Where is this coming that has been promised? Everything has remained the same. 
The world constantly wants to tell us that our hope is a vain hope. And the word of God tells us clearly it is not a vain hope. It is something that is solid. Look again at Job one more time. Job 41 and verse 9. Job 41 and verse 9. Behold the hope of him, and this is relating to uh, Leviathan. And in the margin, uh, this reads, Behold the hope of overcoming him is futile or in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? The Christian's hope is something better than the one who will stand before God and not be able, as the word of God tells us, who will stand when he appears. So the Christian's hope is not a hypocritical hope and it is not a vain hope. Now for the rest of our time, I want to look positively at what it is from our text. It is three things. It is a saving hope, it is an unrealized hope, and it is a patient hope. A saving hope, an unrealized hope, and a patient hope. We are saved by hope. It is a saving hope. How or why is this hope a saving hope? Because it is real. Because it is something that is true. Again, look with me at Job. I forgot we were going to look back one more time. Job chapter 11 and verse 16. Job chapter 11 and the 16th verse. Because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away and thine age shall be clearer than the noonday, thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning, and thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Isn't that a wonderful statement in verse 18? And thou shalt be secure. Why? Because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety and thou shalt lie down and none shall make thee afraid yea many shall make suit unto thee but the eyes of the wicked shall fail and they shall not escape and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost thou shalt be secure because our hope is a real hope it is something definite so first of all this hope is a saving hope because it is real but secondly this hope is a saving hope because it is in the Lord you see the wicked's hope and a vain hope is not in God it's not in the Lord but our hope is a saving hope because it is in the Lord look at some wonderful verses in Psalm 16 and verse 8 these are wonderful uh, verses. Psalm 16 and verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In the presence, in thy presence, is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures for evermore. Because the Lord is our hope, we have a sure hope. Over in Psalm 38. Verse 15, for in thee, O Lord, do I hope thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. 
Psalm 39, 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? For my hope is in thee. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, don't we? Is this true of us? Brothers and sisters, it is so easy for us to slip from this place. It is so easy for us to fall off the perch of trusting in God alone. Of starting to make the foolish error of trusting in self. What we are doing and how we live. Even to trust in my times of devotion. And our brother made reference that that's good and it's a blessing to have those times. But that is not the basis of our trust. The basis of our trust or the foundation of our trust and the, the ground of our hope is in God himself. Not in the things of God. Not in the, the things we do for God. But in the Lord is my righteousness. As we sang in one of our psalms in his righteousness alone when the psalmist is downcast he argues with himself thus psalm 42 verse 5 why art thou cast down O my soul and why art thou disquieted in me hope thou in God for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance again he repeats the same words in verse 11 of that psalm why art thou cast down on my soul and why art thou disquieted within me hope thou in God for I shall yet praise him that's his hope that's his assurance if he is trusting in the Lord don't we know all too well that it is when we stop trusting in God that we lose this hope, that we lose this confidence, that we start to become like those who are searching in the dark. Psalm 43, again, verse 5, the same. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? What is the problem? What is the need? The need is for me to hope in God. And to trust in him in such a way. That he will bring glory and light to my very countenance. He is the health of our countenance. God is. It is not... The peripherals. It is not even the doctrine. The doctrine is so important. But it's not those things. I've said this to you before. I know too many Calvinists who are in the world today. I know one Calvinist who's in a homosexual relationship today. It's not doctrine. It's not doctrine. Now, of course, he doesn't believe in those things practically anymore. But he once did. He once proudly proclaimed that he believed in the doctrines of grace. And now he's living with another man. Strange, isn't it? But then we have an encouragement to hope in the Lord. Psalm 130, verse 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. I love that phrase, plenteous redemption. It's, it's like saying, you know, God's salvation. It, 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 there's, just, there's not only enough for us, but it's overflowing. God's salvation will never be out supplied. Psalm 146 Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help whose hope is in the Lord. 
if we want to be happy tonight, we must have hope personally in God himself. There must be that personal trust in the Lord in order for us to be satisfied and have this wonderful gift of hope. But then thirdly, it is a saving hope because it is grounded on the word of God. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4. Just three verses here. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. It is the foundation of God's word. In other words, we are not experiencing some metaphysical relationship with someone that we know nothing of. We have hope grounded on the gospel of truth, on the very words of God. That is the hope, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, guaranteed by the very word of God, guaranteed by the Lord Jesus Christ in his gospel of truth or the truth of the gospel as it says it here in fact Hebrews tells us that God cannot lie that's why our hope is real that's why our hope is sure and steadfast as Hebrews tells us because we are not as Paul could put it dreaming up craftily invented fables we are not dreaming up our own ideas hoping for the best as uh, some of those quotes at the beginning would suggest. Psalm 119 49 says, Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Our hope is caused by the word of God. The same Psalm, verse 81, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. I am fainting. I am struggling. I am weak. But I take my stand on the word of God and therefore I have hope. The same psalm. Verse 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Notice here the emphasis our previous point was hoping in the Lord himself. But how do we hope in the Lord himself? We hope in the Lord through his promises, through his word. In other words, we don't know God apart from this word. Therefore, the only way we can hope and trust in him is through his very word. Verse 116. Uphold me according unto thy word, that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. In other words, if I'm not upheld according to the word of God, my hope might be false. In fact, my hope will be false unless God upholds me according to his word. Psalm 130 verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. Wait. And his hope and in his word do I hope. So this hope is a saving hope. This hope saves the soul. This hope gives us the assurance of eternal life grounded on the very promises of God who cannot lie. That's our hope tonight. Our hope is founded and grounded on the word of a God who cannot lie. 
So therefore, the next time we are talking to an atheist, that's our answer. Our hope is grounded on his word. But then secondly, our second main heading on this, it is an unrealized hope. Verse 24, back in our text. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? What is biblical hope? Well, we've already answered that. But it is not like worldly hope which contains a large measure of doubt. It actually means a confident expectation. Our, brother, our sister, I was going to say our brother, our sister Eleni, um, was telling us the other day that the word in the Portuguese Bible is a word that means weight. It means weight. That's interesting. Turn back to the text for a moment. Because I think that's very helpful. Turn back to Romans chapter 8 and those two verses. What I want us to do, I want to read those two verses together. And instead of reading the word hope, we are going to read the word weight. For we are saved by waiting. But waiting that is seen is not waiting. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet wait for? But if we wait for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Isn't that very helpful? Not a very helpful way to read those verses. We are waiting. It's not that we are saying, well, will this happen? I can't use the worldly way of using the word. I hope it will happen. No, no. We are waiting for it to happen. We are waiting for these promises. And therefore, it calls, and I'm jumping into the third point, patience. <laughs> it calls for patience. But also look at verse 20, just to show again, to support the point about this word. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. And I wrongly applied willingly there, I think, to God in our previous sermon. I believe it actually should apply uh, to the creation. But by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Now hope definitely refers to God there. Here is God doing something in hope. It doesn't mean that God is unsure of the outcome. But God is waiting for his plans and purposes to be unfolded and to be fulfilled. We hope in the same sense. We are waiting for God's plan and purposes to be unfolded and to be fulfilled in that same way. So the word hope in scripture is never an idea of doubt. It is just the idea of waiting for something that will definitely take place. Then lastly, it is a patient hope. Verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Notice there, we see it not, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's there. We don't see it with our physical eyes. But according to the word of God, it is there. The Lord Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return to bring you to where I am, that where I am, you may be also. He goes on to say, if this were not true, what? I would have told you. You see, it's all grounded on his precious promise. In fact, the word of God tells us that by these great and precious promises, we take our refuge in these things so that we might have a good hope and so on. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3 says, Remembering without, ce without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, do we have that patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Or are we sometimes more like the children of Israel in the wilderness, complaining? It's not happened yet. What's going on? What's the problem? Where's all this promises? No, no. It's there. This is the message here. The message is this. God has said it is all there for us. All he's asking us to do is to wait patiently. So while the world is, you know, as uh, Psalm 46, therefore although the earth be removed, we will not be afraid. Why? Because God's promises are the foundation. Though everything else is collapsing around us, people are getting worried because the weather is getting a bit colder. And so, oh, what's happening? No, no. It doesn't matter what happens. The Lord Jesus Christ, even if heaven and earth pass away, my word shall not pass away. That's our foundation. That's our confidence. That's our hope and trust. <coughs> Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That's what it comes back to, isn't it? In Romans 5, and we'll close with these. In Romans 5... Verses 3 to 5, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Or in the margin it says, does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which he has given unto us. So, God has not just given us his word as a guarantee, but he has given us his very spirit as the earnest of our inheritance, as the down payment, as the guarantee that everything in Romans 8 says, Romans 8 says in verse 31 and 32, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God has given us his word, his spirit, and his son to prove to us all these promises are true. Could you imagine a God who would give his son to the cross and then not give us the blessings of that? God sent Christ to Calvary to prove to your soul the blessings that are waiting for you in heaven. Reserved, Peter says, kept in heaven for you. We have reason to hope the Christian's hope is so unlike the hope of this world because it is grounded on God himself on his word on his son and on his spirit we should be the most satisfied people on this earth shouldn't we the most satisfied people in this world. Let us stand for prayer. Oh Lord, we we just in our hearts fall down in thankfulness. And Lord, we acknowledge that we have so much so much reason to give thee thanks. What a God. What a Savior. That you have done so much to convince us of this hope. Of this blessed hope. Of one day that we will be in the very glory. The glory of heaven. And that God will say unto us one day, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. O oh Lord, all this is of thee alone. It is nothing of us. 
Lord, one of the feelings that maybe we have now at this moment is what a wonderful God who's just done all this and it's completely nothing of me. And that is the way it should be. For Lord, except you had left us a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. We deserved hell, but you have given us heaven. We deserved condemnation, but thou hast given us justification. We deserved the very hatred of God, but we have received the love of God. We deserved no peace, but thou hast given us perfect, eternal peace. Oh, what hope. Oh, what reason. Oh, what grounds. Bless us this night. We give thee thanks for even those things that we shall receive. Even the very bread that goes into our mouth is because thou art a faithful God. All that we have is of thee. And we give thee all our thanks. And the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.